Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Everybody glad to be here this morning? Yes. All right. Good day. Beautiful day. Let's turn to page 327 in our hymn, The Old Rugged Cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. The Uh, with 
uh, heartfelt thanks to each of you uh, in your faithfulness and in your uh, willingness to, to serve and to listen and to be faithful to be here. And it makes uh, what I do so much easier. And I do uh, appreciate that uh, from you. And so uh, I thank you for that. Um, and appreciate the, the message uh, that was there as well. But, uh, I didn't know what I was getting into. I don't mean just here, Jane. My wife does that a lot. I'm starting something and I take a breath to go. She, she's already gone somewhere with it, you know, and I, I go, no. <laughs> just wait. Let me. I didn't know what I was getting myself into when I did say to God I would be obedient to your call when I'm 16. And, uh, you know, I knew, or it made it real easy. I knew, I knew that I didn't have to take advanced math classes in high school or uh, advanced biology classes. I could have, but I knew I didn't have to because that wasn't the direction God called me. Uh, Katie and I went to Louisville, I know, we went to uh, Little Rock to pick up the rest of stuff that we, she couldn't get earlier in the week on Thursday, so uh, we left about 5 in the morning, got back about 9.30 that night. So. But one of the things she asked me, so I got, you know, got to talk to her, one of the things she asked me, she said, Dad, what, what would you have done if you hadn't been in the ministry pastor? And honestly, I said to her, I don't know. I don't know. I said, I suppose maybe I'd have been a teacher. My dad was a teacher. Some of my brothers, nephews, and nieces have been teachers. Ah, but I'm glad. I'm glad that call, God called me into the ministry. I'm glad that I followed his call. And uh, the biggest thing for me to say to you, and in my entire time in the ministry, God has been faithful. He has been faithful. And uh, there have been, you know, ups and downs like anybody's life. There have been ups and downs in my life. But God has been faithful. And you know what? He's going to be faithful for the rest of my life. I don't know will be. And I'm so glad for that. And as I said, thank you for your faithfulness. And for I cherish your smiles, your laughter. I, I cherish your, your love, your concerns. Uh, you are a good church family. And I hope you're glad that you were part of Harmony Baptist Church. I certainly am glad that I'm a part of this church. That said, please make special attention or pay special attention to things that are taking place in life. Our church, there's some same things listed there for you. And uh, uh, opportunities to serve and worship. There's another there at the bottom of the first column. Uh, the Duck River Associational uh, revival, and uh, there will be a, a Sunday, this uh, November 7th through 9th, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, 6 o'clock, three different churches. Dr. Michael Catt will be the speaker. He is recently retired from uh, uh, the church, Sherwood Baptist Church, Georgia. They're the ones that produced uh, some of the Christian films that uh, you may have Seen courageous and uh, what's the other one? Fireproof, yeah. Facing giants. I, that was one I was thinking, but I was there's a there's a, another movie that I've seen called We Must Be Giants. That was the first thing that came to my head. But no, that's not it. So thank you. But uh, one of the themes and the theme really for our association this next year is revival and. Uh, we, we would want to see our churches revived. We want to see uh, our lives revived. We want to see God's people uh, ministering and serving and doing what they can to spread the gospel. That's what we're called to do. And we have been, uh, by God's graciousness, in some ways I look at it, we've been called to do that within uh, 
the Southern Baptist Church and Southern Baptist family. And uh, although, as you know, there will be no denominations in heaven, okay? Please remind some of your friends of that if you need to. The only people who will be in heaven will be God's children. And it does say they will come from every tribe and nation, every language. What a wonderful thing to think about. How God will populate heaven with his children. I hope you're one of his children. Well, let's continue in our worship. Uh, when, when Jimmy sent these songs to me, I looked at them, I said, all but the last one. I, I said, I've sung all these this week to people, so it was good. Nice choices. <laughs> They're good. Let's see. Well, let's uh, turn down to page uh, 705. <coughs> it is well with my soul. And uh, as the pastor was talking about there, you know, uh, if God calls you to do something, uh, don't. You know, I mean, it's, it's, I guess it's our nature to run from Him. But He can run faster than we can. And, uh, and you might as well just say, here I am, Lord, use me, you know. It's well with my soul. And uh, so, uh, it's, it, and, and it is rewarding to, to work for the Lord. And, uh, it's it's uh it's not an easy life. But uh the feeling within, you know, that uh, I mean I don't claim to be a singer, I don't claim to be a preacher or a Sunday school teacher or anything, you know. But a long time ago I stood up and I said, Lord, here I am. Use me in whatever a way that you would like. And I believe that those were the scariest words that I have just ever come out of my mouth, you know. And right to this day, right now, I'm standing up here, my legs are shaking, you know what I mean? It, it's, it's scary because it's, I'm, I'm not doing this, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not doing this for you guys. I'm doing it for the king of all kings, you know. And, uh, and I know sometimes, well, what if I couldn't do anything without him? I know that. And uh, but it is well with my soul. Sing loud. When peace like a river, I tend my way. When sorrows like sea billows flow. Oh, 
you know, in her produced her heart to sing and uh, also understanding that he had called her and of course his disciples to follow and to believe that he was risen. So uh, if that busted your bubble, sorry, but that just, it, it busted mine, so I, I didn't want to be alone in that at all. But I thought it really uh, made some sense uh, for some of the, uh, the words in that as well. Before we get into uh, the fourth beatitude that we've been looking at, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Join with me if you would. Father, as we come before you this morning, we want to offer to you our thanks and we want to say to ourselves that we understand just how wonderful and faithful and merciful and gracious God you are. You brought us to this place in our lives to be together to worship you. And we are grateful for your love and we are grateful for the things that you do in our lives. And Lord, too many to count the blessings even in this last week that you have given to us. And though I don't know all the ins and outs, Lord, of each one here uh, and what they've gone through this week, I am sure that there have been some challenges and some hurdles and even some frustrations, but you have taken us through that. We come here this morning again to bring thanks and praise to you, to your Son Jesus Christ who died for us that we might have life eternal, for your Holy Spirit that is a gift given to us so that we might know who you are and that we may walk in a manner worthy of you. And each of us as well, the Lord has concerns people and the situations on our hearts and on our minds and we lift those up to you now to ask that you will take care of what is going on in, in all ways and in all things. We ask for your will to be done, Father, and we go with that. We understand that it is you and you alone that works through your purposes in our lives. And though we may not know it, we trust that all things will work together for our good. And we do trust you. We trust you to be faithful and gracious and merciful. We trust you to hear our prayers. We trust you to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We ask as we study your word and look at your word today, Father, that you will give us insight. And even if it's one thing, it is one thing. May we apply it to our lives for you. In the name of Jesus, amen. We have been and will continue to be. I've been looking at, I uh, looked at the calendar and we will be going into December with this. Right at the first. But again, I think it's important. Uh, somebody said to me the other day, uh, as we were had finished going through some verses there in Hebrews on Wednesday night, he said, you know, it's just it's kind of amazing that that we spend an hour looking at three verses. And he was saying it in a positive way, okay? He said that we take the time and look and see what those verses say to us. And what kind of impact they could have in our lives. And I appreciated that. And I said, you know, there are some things, there's a lot of things, that's not some things. There are a lot of things in the world that we really need to take our time with. And we need to let the Spirit of God work in us and teach us. There's a, a pastor who was holding a revival, and his uh, his text was John 3:16, which is not unusual, you know, for a revival or services like that. And so he, he preached that on the first night of the revival, and he 
preached out of John 3.16 on the second night of the revival. And he preached out of John 3.16 on the third night of the revival. And someone came to him and said, why are you continuing to preach on the same verse time and time again? And he said, well, when you get it, I'll move on to something else. I think that spending some time here in the Beatitudes, I, I hope it's blessed your life. It's, it's blessing my life as I look at it, study and pray about it. And so we are going again, as we've talked about in our habit and what we've been doing, of course, is when we look at each Beatitude the first week, we look at what does this mean? What is Jesus saying to us here? And the second week, we're looking at how can we put this into practice within our own lives. And so we are here on Matthew 5, 6. Uh, blessed or blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And today we are looking at the, uh, the application of this, how we do it. And we saw from last week, if you were here, and if not, thank you. Uh, one, to, to Forrester sets things up every week to take these, and thank you to for those who get them in the right places on Facebook and so that it can be shared that way. Uh, if you don't have Facebook, let us know. It's, there is on YouTube, I think, as well that you can get to. If you can't get that, uh, we can probably uh, record it for you and put it on a, a disc in some way, shape, or form. Right? Audio or DVD. Okay, so we can even do a DVD for you. So uh, we want you to have those uh, if you need those. But we did look at last week that the, the mark of a true Christian is not how he or she feels or that they feel righteous, but they long to be more righteous. When it comes to righteousness, the blessed people that Jesus is talking about are not those who think they have righteousness, but those who feel their need for it. They hunger for it. They thirst for it. They may have righteousness. Now, by that I mean that you know, they are trying to live a, a life that is a worthy of Jesus Christ. They're trying to be more holy, if you'll put it, holier, not than somebody else, but they are trying to grow in their Christian life to be more like Christ. And they realize that there is so much more to have that Christ can give to them in their growth. The person who is blessed is the one, though, as we understand, who has become poor in spirit. They recognize that they don't have what it takes. They mourn over their sins. They understand that what sin does to themselves, what it does, it has its effects on others, and what it did for Jesus Christ. For Christ came to die for our sins. My sin put him on the cross. And when you realize that it has done, you, you should mourn about your sin and what it has done. And then we understand that uh, you are blessed if you become submissive to the will of God. That is a meekness. That's where we go with that. And out of that, out of the roots of those things, we just said the first three uh, Beatitudes, we come then to hunger for God, to want more of God. Aren't you glad that Jesus did not say, blessed are the righteous, for they will be satisfied? Because if he had said that, guess what? None of us would get satisfied because none of us are righteous and none of us could get there to be blessed. But he did say that you will be blessed if you hunger for that righteousness. You see, it's not the realization of the desire, but the desire itself that Christ pronounces blessed. In your professions that you have had, some of you as you've retired, those that you have, there are rules and regulations, aren't there, that govern what you do. And for some of you, there are a lot of rules and regulations for what you do. Uh, in, uh, in my uh, area, in the hospice, uh, there are so many government regulations that we, you know, and they keep changing, uh, and we, we do it one way, and then we come back and find out we were doing it wrong, and you should do it this way. And, it just seems to be a, a, a just more and more and more. But the thing is, when you have these rules and regulations, there are ethical questions that come into play uh, for you. Do you do this or do you not do this? Do you uh, do this because you want to have a foot up on your competitors? Or, you know, do you, uh, it just 
it get, can get kind of messy, can it, and, and all that. And so there's a fine line in the systems in our professions that we have to look at. If where you worked, if there had been people in key positions who were hungering and thirsting after righteousness, I wonder how that would have been for you or even for others within the context of your work. And even for you and whatever you do now, if you are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, how does that affect those around you as well as for you? You see, that hunger and thirst for righteousness produces a hope within you to be better, to live better. Folks, one of the things that, that I hear a lot from our millennial generation is when they come to churches, they are tired of seeing hypocrites. And I understand what they mean by that. Because they say, I know some of these people who are sitting with me. Of course, their expectations may be really high. And they are one way there in church praising God, and then they're another way when they are at work or where I see them in the community. And it brings down, if you will, the credibility of Christians and the church. But what if we were different? What if we lived our lives consistently, not only as we live our lives among our friends here at Harvey Baptist Church when we gather together, but live the same when we're out in the world? And I know it's not easy, okay? I know it's not always easy whatever situation you find yourself in. But Jesus says to take the root that you've found in the Beatitudes that we've already looked at in hunger and thirst for righteousness and you will be satisfied. And it will make a difference in your life. Imagine if you would, if people, instead of them asking what's in it for me, they began to ask what would honor God and be good for others as well as for me because God is saying I want to bless you in your life and I can and will. Do you ask God to make you a person that hungers and thirsts for Him? Think about that. When I leave church, do I ask God, Lord, help me to love you. Help me to thirst for you. Help me to honor you in the things that I do. You see, Jesus said, you're blessed if you hunger and thirst. And not long after that, he said, those who do that, you see, they will be the salt of the earth. And they will be a light to the world. And this hunger and thirsting for righteousness is of huge importance in every area of your life. One of the things that we have done so much of in our lives is to compartmentalize. This is this part of my life, this is this part of my life, this is this part of my life. And sometimes they don't, you know, the, only, the only thing that's common is you about it, right? But not every area of those lives that we compartmentalize do we find Christ working with you because you've chosen to separate him or yourself from him. The question we want to answer today is how can I cultivate this hunger and thirst of righteousness in my life? Hunger is natural, isn't it? Isn't it? Hunger is natural. Appetite, though, can be cultivated. Hunger is natural, but appetite can be cultivated. 
I don't know about you, but I don't think that I could eat escargot. Do you know what escargot is? Snails. Snails. And I suppose they're supposed to be, you know, a delicacy in some ways. I certainly am not going to pick up a snail or a slug out of my car and prepare it to eat it. Well, I guess I could, but what I would have done, I'd just pour salt on it and I'd kill it. You know, that's the wrong thing to do. But if I wanted to, to eat that, I would have to cultivate my appetite. That is, I would have to, to, to work on that. And, and even, you know, for, for some of you thinking some of the food that you eat, it's always the same, isn't it? But it is natural for us to be hungry. And I guess that should be true of those who are born again by God and in the spiritual realm as well. You see, appetite can and should be cultivated. So you saw that the title of uh, this is, is uh, trying to, to get an appetite for God. An appetite for God. In fact, Paul said to Timothy, train yourself for godliness. So he's saying really to Timothy, there are certain things that you can do that will help you to advance, to grow in godliness. And this is an appetite within you that can help you to grow. I asked a friend of mine one time who survived a heart attack, I said, what did you feel like? And I asked my mom the same question many years ago, and, and they both said the same thing. It felt like an elephant was sitting on my chest. But let's say you're in a conversation with them, and, and they begin to tell you, well, what did you have to do? What, 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 what's going on? Most of the time, I certainly had to change my diet. So let's think of a conversation between you and the person who's had a heart attack, and he said to you, I have to change my diet. Well, what did you eat beforehand? Well, I have burgers and fries and pizza and ice cream. Probably more than that, too. But that's, you know, those are the things. He said, but the doctor said, now I had to change my diet. Low fat, low sodium, vegetables, fish, chicken, grilled, not fried, and some rice. And when he told me that, I thought this is going to be absolute torture. So in this conversation, you ask him, uh, well, how has it gone? He said, at first it seemed bland and tasteless, but after a while I thought, you know, this isn't so bad. And I felt better, and I, I had more energy. Well, didn't you miss the burgers? Well, yeah, at first. But I didn't miss them as much as I thought, and I certainly didn't want an elephant sit on my chest again. His burgers and fries, they still smell good, but you know, I tried some fries the other day and it made my stomach sick. He said, I discovered that my whole appetite had changed because I changed my diet. And a change of diet led to a change of appetite. Now I'm using the analogy of food because it does all of us eat, don't we? So I think it goes well with Jesus who said, hunger and thirst after righteousness. You see, when we do that, when we thirst for righteousness, we are cultivating our soul and our spiritual life. And the real key is that the appetite can be cultivated. And changing your diet spiritually can change your appetite in what you want. Does that make sense? So when we apply this to the spiritual realm, we have to think, how can we change our diet? How can we change our appetite so that we hunger and thirst for righteousness? And let me say this to, to begin with before I get into uh, this. We, you know, we need to be people of the word. Did you know that Baptists, for a time, were called people of the book? Because they put such an emphasis on Scripture versus some other denominations. The thing is, 
whatever the diet happens to be will show up in what you are. I want to thank uh, Peggy for saying I look thinner. I told her I was wearing those, uh, that slim looking wardrobe that I chose. Actually, Jerry chose it. I just put it on. But you know, so I try to get all my clothes to make me look slim. I don't always succeed. I say that to, to say, though, that I've got to change my appetite. I've got to change my diet. And when I do that, it will change physically my appearance. How do we apply that to our lives? Something to, to think about that your diet shapes your appetite over time. When we come to the church, the church needs to be fed the word of God. And we will see a difference in people's lives. The problem is that in many churches, they're being fed entertainment. And so that's what they eat. That's what they subsist on. And so you've got to continue to give them entertainment or the whole somewhere else. Or some churches do what we call pop psychology. Whatever the felt need is of the day, whatever's trending, we're going to do that because that will attract people. But then that's all they eat. That's a steady diet. So that's what they want. That's what their appetite is. I, I need to have this pop psychology. But if we feed the congregation the word of God over time, there will be a, a church that will hunger and thirst for God. And so that's my hope is what we do here. And I'm sure that is what has been done before I came to be your pastor the men that were chosen to be and lead these churches, or this church, they preached the word of God and fed you that. For diet shapes our appetite over time. That's the fundamental principle. You will want more of what you, whatever you feed yourself. Think about what you eat. Think about how it affects you. Now let's think about your spiritual world. What are you feeding on? What are you feeding on? What is your appetite like? I may get to change my diet uh, just because of some things that are going on. I was talking to one of my doctors and he said, well, you might want to look at this particular kind of, it's not diet, it's the, the, the foods that you might have to cut out. So I got a list of them and started looking at them. There, they were, there are foods that I was eating a whole lot of already. You know, I like my peanut butter and jelly. But I'm finding out peanut butter may not like me. So I'm, you know, that's my appetite and it's got to change. Well, let's get to this because don't we want to be in a place where we say, I want to want you, oh God. I want to want you. Let me give you quickly five strategies for cultivating a godly appetite. Five strategies for cultivating a godly appetite. The first one is to gain momentum from the first three Beatitudes. And that's just a reminder to us that we can't just start at the fourth Beatitude and say, I want righteousness. I'm going to work on righteousness. We really do have to go to these first. We've talked about this as, as monkey rings one to the other and a momentum that takes us. But we've got to start at the first ring. We can't start at the fourth ring. We can't start at the fifth ring. We have to start at the beginning. Now that doesn't mean we have to spend, you know, six weeks being poor in spirit and three months mourning over our sins before we can move on. In fact, the wonderful thing about the Spirit of God is that within us is that He can do all these things at one time. And we will see that we show and know our poverty before God. We can see that we, what our sins have, the effects they have on, on others, we can submit ourselves unconditionally to the, to the will of God and it can happen all at once. It can happen today, folks, for you. And then as that takes place, 
and we begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness. You can't start at the fourth beatitude. Just like, you know, a seed has to have a root as it grows. And you have to have growth before it produces fruit. So we see a progression here in the Beatitudes. So remember that. You start with that. Know where you start and how you get to this particular Beatitude. Okay, the second strategy is this. Practice fasting from legitimate pleasures. Practice fasting from legitimate pleasures. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And that deny self has many different applications within our lives. But the principle is a very simple one. Restrict what spoils your appetite. Do you know that snacks in between meals can spoil your appetite? You know, if you snack on chips and mini chips in the afternoon, you may not be ready to eat your meal at night. Now, there's not anything sinful or bad in a bag of chips. Because, you know, Doritos are a good gift to God. And if you ask Diana, she's not here, but if you would ask her, she would say anytime she gets together with anybody, you got to have chips and dip. Right? So they're good. But you eat them at the wrong time in the wrong amount, and they're not good. It spoils your appetite. So let's look about that in the principle of the world of the soul. You see, there are legitimate pleasures that God gives us and that you have. And I say legitimate, it may be something like uh, sports or travel or hobbies, things like that. They're legitimate pleasures you have interests in. You know, it may be golfing, it may be fishing, it may be hunting. They're, they're pleasures for you. But if you eat too much of it, or you do uh, at the wrong time, I should say, it could get in the way of growing feeding your soul. Again, legitimate pleasures. And so sometimes we need to fast from legitimate pleasures. Fasting, what does fasting do for you? It, it helps to cleanse the body. It also is a heightening of self-control because you say no to something. It is a special gift that can be used in the spiritual realm to help you master something that you otherwise might master you. So you choose to deny yourself a legitimate pleasure for a season. Have you ever, some Christians do this, by the way. Uh, it's generally done right before Easter. You ever hear somebody say, you know, I'm giving something up for Lent. I knew somebody uh, this past year giving up for Lent. They said, I'm staying off of Facebook. That was okay. They actually found it okay <laughs> for them, you know. But my question is, why do we wait for, we only do this at Easter time? It may be that we need to back off of some things, get legitimate pleasures, not those that are wrong for us, but things that God has given us that we enjoy. Maybe we need to back off a little bit if they are taking the place of spending time with God. You know, I asked somebody one time about their relationship with God. They said, well, I don't go to church much. You know, I knew they went out on the golf course a lot. And they said, you know, because I go out on the golf course and I can see God out there. Said, okay. And I didn't know their habits, you know. Maybe they prayed over every shot, you know. Maybe they praised God for making good shots. Maybe they cursed God. I don't know when they didn't do so but that was their thing. I, I meet God on the golf course, and I wanted to, to say, well, you know, God is everywhere, and I think you can meet him in some other places. It might be good. Various back there saying, you're picking on golf a lot today. No. 
any pleasure that God gives us that we abuse, misuse, can get in the way of our relationship with the one who gave it. So we have to be careful. Maybe we need to wean ourselves off of some of these uh, unhealthy appetites. Practice fasting from legitimate pleasures. This may help you in your hunger desire for righteousness. The third strategy is this. Make yourself vulnerable to the needs of others. Make yourself vulnerable to the needs of others. How do you work up a good appetite? It is, I just, it, for me, it's I just do. No. no, if you exercise, doesn't that help to work up? You burn off calories and your body says, feed me. You know, it's, it's like I need some more calories. I burn off. So exercise it really is a good way to, to work up a good appetite. And this is true when it comes to nourishing your soul as well. To extend yourself into serving others. Stretch yourself out in meeting the needs of others. Especially when you see those who are in great need. And I think when you do that, when you think not so much of yourself, and you think of others, and you extend yourself in that, you will increase your thirst for righteousness. As we think about this in relationship to Jesus, think, and Jesus said, blessed are the righteous, who are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And as we look at the Beatitudes, and we look at what Jesus said, and we say that Jesus is our righteousness, we say that Jesus was saying to his followers, this is me, be like me. Well, how did Jesus practice this fourth beatitude? I mean, he is the righteous one. He has all righteousness himself. How could he hunger and thirst for what he already had? Well, the answer lies in the incarnation itself. You see, he left the comforts of heaven, and he came into our world where righteousness had been lost. He humbled himself and he became a servant. And as he looked around, he saw people that were like sheep without a shepherd. And his own heart was moved with compassion. And it says that Jesus went around doing good works. Doing things. The principle in this, for this is this. Make yourself vulnerable to the needs of others. And your hunger and thirst for righteousness will increase. That means you have to be open to see how people are hurting. And then say, how can I meet those needs? Can I? You may not be able to. Okay? You may not be able to, to pick up everybody that's walking by the side of the road. It's not safe for you to do so. God may not call you to do that. I know somebody, it's been some years ago, but he, he did that just about every time he could. Because he felt safe in doing that. And that God would honor what he was trying to do to get somebody a little further down the road. Or maybe there's a neighbor that needs your help. And you know that. And you go out of your way. Even if they don't ever tell you thank you. There are ways for us to do that. To, to stimulate our spiritual appetite by serving others. As Jesus said that, I came not to be served, but to serve. And when he washed his disciples' feet, he said to them, Do you understand what you have just seen? What I have done for you, you need to do for others. That doesn't mean let's go practicing foot washing in the church. That doesn't, don't take that away from any churches that do that, okay? But if that's the only foot washing you do, and the only way you serve others, then that's not enough. That's not what Jesus called us to do. He did call us to serve others. I think we put these things together, we will see that as we do what I've been talking about, that we will have an appetite that will desire. Our appetite is for righteousness. The fourth strategy is this. Use your blessings and troubles as incentives to feed on Jesus Christ. Use your blessings and troubles. One of the things that Jesus said to his followers and to us, he said, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 6, when he says this, he also says, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And he was talking about himself. And so there are people thinking, how do I eat on you? I don't understand this teaching. I don't want this teaching. And they left him. Visual is what we were talking about 
the other day a little bit. How Jesus said some things and people that followed him, it was too hard for them. And part of that was right here in John chapter 6. He says, you must eat of me. But he was saying, I am the bread of life. Remember the woman at the well when he talked about that? He, give me some of that water so I don't have to get, get out. And what she didn't realize was the living water was sitting right next to her. Standing there talking to her. And Jesus made it clear to her that he was the Messiah, the one they could give to her. Don't you think that changed her life? It did. It changed her life completely. Because she understood that she could drink spiritually of Jesus Christ. That she could feed on what Jesus gives to her. How can we stimulate spiritual appetite? Well, there was a, a Puritan writer who, who said that he, 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 uh, he talked about it. He said, how, he said, what makes you eager to eat a meal? So, you know, in doing that, he said, how can we grow spiritually? How do we provoke our appetite, grow an appetite spiritually? The first thing he said was exercise. That made sense. The second thing he said is very interesting, especially since it comes from somebody who lived in the 1600s. He said the second thing that would help spur that appetite, he was talking physically, but he moved it into the spiritual realm, was sauce. Sauce. Do you ever put the thing sauce on food to make it better? Come on, none of you use, I always use mild because the other stuff is too hard on my stomach, okay? But you put mild sauce or you put a uh, hot sauce or you put very hot sauce on it, you know? I mean, I mean, think about it. Uh, it does sometimes make food more attractive, doesn't it, when you put that sauce or gravy or something on it? Makes you pretty good. Well, what if God increases our hunger and our thirst for righteousness by the sweet sauce of our blessings? Or the sharp sauce of our troubles, and for some even the hot sauce of our persecutions. You see, when we have a blessing in our life, we should say, God, you're so good, and I want to know more of you through that. But also, if we understand and know the troubles and persecutions that might come in our lives, and we say, thank you, God, for that. Why? Because it is making me more like you. But whatever God puts on your plate, cultivate your relationship with him. That's really what I'm saying. You will have blessings. You will have troubles. But let them force you, if you will, to feed on Him. And I think you will find that you will know Him better. And you will develop an appetite to have more and more of what God is giving you. Our fifth strategy is to trust Christ, and especially for your sanctification. When you talk to Christians, so often you feel that they trust Christ in their salvation. And they trust that Christ will get them to heaven. But when it comes to being a better Christian, or a more effective Christian, or a more loving Christian, or a Christian who's more like Jesus Christ, we feel like, well, that's just hopeless. I mean, look at me. I know me, and I can never be like him. You ever said that to yourself? I can't be like Jesus. And we trust him. Yes, Jesus has saved me and I'm, I'm saved. And Jesus will take me to heaven one day. But we don't trust him. We don't hope in him to grow us. Philippians 1 6 is so important for you to understand and know. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete that work. Well, we're all about the completion of that work. We're ready for heaven, but we forget that He's in the middle working at us to, uh, and on us to be more like He is. And so trust Him in the things that are happening in your life. Trust Him that He knows what He's doing. Trust Him that He can grow you in your Christian life. 
If I ask any Christian, are you where you want to be, I think, in your Christian life, you would say, what would you say? No, thank you. For those of you who are honest, I think all of us would say that. I'm not where I want to be. But are you trusting to Jesus? Are you hoping that he will make you better? Or are you just saying, well, that's who I am. I can't be any better. That's it. Really? The one who created all things and the one who's recreating you, you can't trust him to make you better than you are as a Christian, more like him? Trust him. Trust him. Paul said to the Thessalonians, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. It's not like God says, you know, not this guy, not this lady. I can't work with him. Isn't Christianity, isn't a relationship with Jesus Christ about change? Isn't it about changing who you are? Well, it is. So trust and hope. For Jesus came to deliver you from your sins. He is your righteousness, your sanctification, your redemption. If you can trust Jesus for forgiveness, if you can trust him for entrance into heaven, then trust him to change you by cultivating a greater hunger and thirst for righteousness. And why is this important that we hunger and thirst for righteousness? And ask him to change us. It's hope. It's hope. As long as you believe that change is beyond you, you will never change. Because you won't attempt to change. Knee replacements are very difficult. After my first knee replacement, you know, I sat around and let the machine do my work. <laughs> Once I sat around, I lay in bed for a while, and just that machine would go, and then I'd stop it, and then I'd start it again. You know of what I'm talking about, my physical therapist friend. <laughs> and when I had my second knee replacement, when the therapist came in to my room the, the, the uh, first time that I met her, because, you know, we do some therapy before we leave the hospital. Well, my doctor doesn't use the machine, or that doctor doesn't use the machine on you at home. He uses it in the, so I was going to go that. So she said, this is what I want you to do. And you know what I said in my head? I can't. I even, here, I'm going to be honest with you, I broke down in tears, not because of the pain, but because I just said to, I said to myself, I can't do this. I'm not going to do this. But then I knew that in not doing it, I would not only disappoint my doctor, I would disappoint my own body because if I didn't do it, then that was, I just went through something that wasn't going to work. So the next time she came in, that afternoon, I said, let's do this. And I did. And it hurt. But you know what? My second knee was perfect compared to my first. I mean, just zip, zip right through. Zip right through. I'd show up in physical therapy, and they'd say, we got this. they say, you want to eat her? Her eyes, I said, no, I'm good. Okay. So i just go to the bike. I started 10 minutes on the bike. Then i go, I just, I just did all my things. They didn't have to tell me what to do unless they added a new thing. Why? Because I knew that I could. I changed my thoughts. I said, I can change. I can do this. I had hope in what it would do and accomplish for my body. And when you translate that to the spiritual world, you cannot change if you don't have hope. And that is hope in the one who is going to change you, Jesus Christ. And with him, change is possible. With him, growth is possible. There's hope to be a better person and to live a better life in Jesus now. Will you have setbacks? Certainly. Certainly. But the more I did, the more and better I was able to walk and do what I needed to with my legs. 
The person who trusts and hopes in Jesus knows that one day he or she will be fully like him. That's what the Bible says to us. We will be like him. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for God and for righteousness. Not only will they not be disappointed, they will be satisfied. Pray with me if you would. Father, it's not easy <laughs> to apply or to trust in what you say sometimes. And yet I trust that those who are here this morning that they have given their lives to you and so they are saying to you in that help me to grow more and more like you but some of us need to change our appetites we need to change our diet and in doing so Lord we will hunger for you Father, you are our Redeemer. You are the one who has the power to change us. The power that is your Holy Spirit. Father, now in our own lives, if you work in them, if you talk to us, if there's something we need to share with others, if there's something we need to communicate with you or commune with you, then let us do so now. For each of us, may we come to you in faith and hope and trust. And may we be obedient to your spirit. In Jesus' name.